think I need to go into any detail to explain just how troubled our country and by extension Africa and the rest of the world is. There's a paucity of leadership and therefore alive to the reality that the whole world celebrates, commemorates the critical leadership role that the first president of South Africa played, we should pause and reflect and say, but who was Nelson Mandela? What would he expect of every South African? What would he expect of every African and any other person around the world who is a leader? Let me begin by saying each and every one of us is a leader, by the way. Leadership is never really positional. It is functional leadership that matters. And be careful about those who are prepared to do everything even outside of the book to ascend to a leadership position. It's never those they claim to seek to represent that they really seek to represent, it is their stomachs and their insatiable appetite for power and money that they seek to, to satisfy. So, I would like to say uh, a few things as briefly as uh, a lawyer cum preacher could say <laughs> and allow for some question and answer engagement. For I believe to, that to resolve our country's key challenges this moment, the eve of the birthday of Madiba, requires of each and every one of us to reflect on how we could contribute towards the eradication of corruption, all crime, and ethical leadership and poor governance in our country. Things have gone wrong, and we were watching. We were too concerned about our careers, our money-making op uh, opportunities, and possibilities to ascend to positions of leadership more than we were, if we were at all, about the plight of the suffering masses of South Africa, of Africa and the rest of the developing world. So, based on the quotation, Nelson Mandela clearly requires and expects of each and every one of us to have a lifetime commitment to something. So the question is, since he had dedicated his life to a cause, what is it that you have dedicated your life to? I was touched one day, Reverend Matebula sent me a, a WhatsApp message. And that was at the time when he, he was or had been to Mozambique. When circumstances cried out for intervention after that cyclone. And I said, but where are the South Africans? Where am I? If we care as much as we often say when we have opportunities to speak, because we know people expect us to say it, what is the, where do we find the practical expression of that which we profess? So what are you committed to? He made reference to the struggle. His commitment or his dedication to the struggle of the African people. Until you come to grasp, to gra until you grasp the fundamentals of the situation of the African people, you'll never really feel impelled to do anything about their plight. The kind of poverty that obtains in Africa is nauseating. If you are the leader that I believe you ought, we all ought to be, you ought to drop a tear from time to time when you reflect deeply and soberly upon the reality that in a continent as well endowed with minerals and natural resources, 
even fertile soil. As South Africa and Africa, multitudes go to bed on a hungry stomach. You simply have to look at the kind of so-called houses that many of them live in. The level of illiteracy, the exploitation and suffering that happens in, 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 in South Africa and Africa. What are we doing about it? Where is the commitment? It ill behooves us to gather here today and in the years to come and talk about Nelson Mandela when there is nothing about Nelson Mandela to show in our individual lives. When most of us are actually behind, hiding behind those who are doing something about, be, uh, something about what needs to be done. So, have you made it your business to soberly reflect on the plight of the African people that Nelson Mandela was talking about? Or have we lulled our consciences to that situation? Does it matter when you pass Kaelicha, Langa, Alexander, Deep Sloot, or any of these places? Does it touch you? Have you allowed it to prick your conscience? That these are human beings, and none of us ought to allow this to be normalized into what South Africans ought to resign themselves to. So what are we doing about it? If we are to gather, that, gather like this next year, this time, here or elsewhere, what progress would each and every one of us be able to share as a contribution towards the realization of the aspirations so artfully crafted in the preamble to our constitution? Have you fully embraced and internalized the fight against injustice, white or black domination, or do you go along with whatever narrative is put out there in the furtherance of whatever sectional agenda might be there to make others look forever good and others look forever bad? Maybe I should pause there. Part of what we need to grapple with here is corruption. Part of what we have to grapple with in Africa and the rest of the world is corruption. But it looks like we have allowed ourselves to be channeled into believing that corruption can only be in the public sector. Believe you me, it takes two to tango. We will never be able to defeat corruption for as long as we, 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 we allow ourselves to be choreographed into believing that corrupt, corruption can only be in the, in the public sector. Or let me be a bit crude about it so that we can really get a root awakening, that it's a black thing. Every human being is capable of being corrupt, and believe you me, I believe we've, we haven't even scratched the surface in relation to the magnitude of the corruption that obtains in the private sector. So, if we are to uproot corruption from South Africa and around the world, we have got to accept as a reality that there are masters of corruption everywhere, even in the church of God. I mean, the shenanigans that we have seen ought to convince us that human infallibility dictates that you will find corruption anywhere. So our, we've got to move from the premise that we're going to make it our business. Not by others at the expense of others. Not to make others untouchable. Not to allow anybody, including me, not to allow anybody to be 
eh, rendered, rendered, eh, why are words running away from me? <laughs> to, 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 to be awarded an undeserved saintly state, status. When you try to scratch the surface about this one, even if indications are there's something there, you will be bombarded with insults and so much negativity that a loud and clear message is sent out that you dare not touch this one. Check. I'm a very frank person. But there are things which I, when I say, like saying there's corruption in the private sector, which is true. Oh, there will be one article all over the other. It will not deal with what I'm saying, but there will be one sidekick after the other. What would Nelson Mandela do? Nelson Mandela would say, I'm even prepared to die for it. An injustice is an injustice regardless of who the perpetrator is. And we will get this country right if moving from this meeting, we are determined not to be told who is clean and who is dirty. We are going to research it ourselves. And when there is a smoke, we will follow it up to its logical conclusion. Let me just mention, by the way, what I'm talking about. I read a story from one of the Sunday papers this past Sunday. There was a human being who was projected as nothing but a drunk. I was left believing that this man is always on a high. Nothing positive can ever come out of the mouth of this one. He is a thoroughly discredited person. And I was left wondering, but why did they have to rely on the evidence of this person? That's the narrative that I was fed. Until on Monday, the man appeared on channel 405. Man was sound. He said, but what was written about me is a lie. And articulated what happened. I'm not saying he was telling the truth. I'm just saying that he didn't strike me as a mad and crazy man who lives in a haze all the time. Sadly, some of the things that we read about other people, some of the things that some of our analysts would like to feed us with are designed to project some in a negative light and others always in a positive light. That is not how to build a nation. Nelson Mandela would never have survived if all South Africans flowed with a negative tide that ran against the cause that he was championing. And I believe that we would do well for the sake of posterity if we were really to take a deep breath. I was touched yesterday morning on Morning Live by what two women uh, Mian, is it Lian, Lian, Manas, Lian Manas and the Sakina were saying, they said, you know, there are things that we don't just allow ourselves to look into, even if there appears to be a smoke. And they raised a particular issue. They said, but why are we not allowing ourselves to probe into this one? That's how we are, we are channeled. Let you touch this one at your peril. Don't go there. The problem is there. Let me round this issue up by saying it will, it will be a disservice to this nation if we were ever to allow ourselves to believe that once you have dealt with a Gupta situation, you have dealt with corruption. It's a fallacy. I carry no brief for them. But think about it. When did our state-owned enterprises begin to lose money massively? Who else is benefiting from the coal issue at ESCOM? What percentage of the coal 
did these people get? Have we ever bothered to want to find out? But how much are other people getting? Is it inflated or not? Who is benefiting from the South African Airways all these years? And any other state-owned enterprise? Why are we not talking about those? Why are we not curious? Mandela would want to know. He stood for the ideal of a truly democratic and free society. And you and I need to allow ourselves to be captured by the ideal of a democratic and free society. I'm in the habit these days of saying, but what is democracy? A government of the people, by the people, and for the people? Does it continue to be so? Even if you stand no chance of winning the elections unless you're connected to the well, financially well-resourced. And if they fund you to the point where you succeed and win and become a government, are you not captured in advance? <laughs> so we need to really think deep about how capture happens. There's no free lunch and never for the millions. You may get free lunch maybe for a thousand rand. But once I begin to give you one million rand, three million, five, fifty, hundred, whether I set you up in business or in government, ah, there will be payback time. Why should I make you a multimillionaire? Why? Why do I prefer you over others? Why? It's an investment. <laughs> Some years back, I went to Nigeria and met the Consul General of South Africa in Lagos. And he said he was invited to a club of 400 top businessmen in Nigeria. And he said to me, my brother, the poorest of them all has got uh, at least one billion American dollars in his, uh, in his bank account. And he said, this is what they said about Nelson Mandela. He said, they say, my brother, Nelson Mandela was truly a man of the people. Look at how poor he died. 35, 000, 35 million rand. <laughs> because, because they know what people operating at that level get. I met another brother from another country who was an advisor to the president. He said, what is this about 250 million against your president? I said, what do you mean? He says, ah, you know, I was an advisor to president so so. I can take out that money from my pocket and give him. <laughs> I said, where do you get it from? <laughs> Where do you get it from as a former advisor? He said, you know, in my country, 10% of every major um, contract belongs to our president. He says it's an unwritten law. It's not, it's not theft. <laughs> so President Mandela really did distinguish himself. The vision of a country where all live together in harmony and with equal opportunities. Do we live together in harmony? Are we trying to live together in harmony? Do we have equal opportunities? I think the good starting point it is to admit the truth. We've got to work hard towards harmonizing relations between black and white South Africans. It is a betrayal of the cause for which Nelson Mandela suffered for us to perpetuate division rather than seek to achieve national unity and reconciliation. 
I know others would say, how can we, when we don't have land, when we don't have this? I'm very much alive to the challenges that confront all of us. But I believe that there is more to be achieved when you allow yourself to be calm, to be sober, and engage in a discussion designed to find solutions rather than trade insults, rather than harden attitudes. I was watching television last night, and I saw that on the most of the, 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 the big companies that are listed on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, 85% of them are managed by white South Africans. The rest of the percentage is shared by the previously disadvantaged. It should concern all of us. What am I suggesting? That people must just be given things? No. But there has got to be, we each on a daily basis must work towards finding a solution to this problem because if a solution is not found, no narrative, however wisely crafted, will enable us to evade the challenges that come with an injustice that is left to live on and on and on. It is an anomaly that the indigents of South Africa and by extension of Africa and the rest of the developing world should not benefit as optimally from the riches of their country as they ought to. It's an anomaly. We are failing our country and posterity if in order not to offend, we lie to each other and say, no, 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 this is normal. Don't worry, it's abnormal. It is nothing to insult one another about. And difficult as it is, like Nelson Mandela, it is something to reflect very deeply on and say, that this looks like an intractable challenge. What is it that we can do about it? Even the land issue, it looks like an intractable challenge that has the potential to rip us apart. You and I, as we celebrate the life of Nelson Mandela on a daily basis, within our circles of influence, owe it to this nation, owe it to posterity and say, but what, what, what can we do? Remember, where there is a will, there is a way. We would never be, I keep on saying, the constitutional democracy that we are had we not decided as black and white South Africans that this impossibility will become a testimony, Reverend Matebula. It, it was our determination to find a solution that got us to where we are. And the same applies to any other serious problem that confronts us. The problem is we don't invest as much time as much energy and as much resources as the magnitude of the problem demands that we do in order for the problem to be solved. We've got to nurture the hope to achieve these ideals in our lifetime. I think there is so much more progress that we can make if moving from this meeting we would refuse to be party to any negativity and the hatred that brews up from time to time here and there. If we can move from this meeting determined that wherever we are in our families and as teachers in the schools where we are, as ministers of the gospel, leaders of faith-based organizations, we are on a regular basis going to make it our business to contribute towards finding a solution to the challenges that confront South Africa, if only out of respect for Nelson Mandela. Let me rush to the last point. When people benefit from wrongdoing, they fight any attempt 
to dislodge them. When people have reached a level where they are prepared to make money and to ascend to power by any means necessary, don't think that they will smile at you when you try to rock the boat. Smear campaigns. Well thought out smear campaigns will be waged against you. Another will write something about you there. Another there, they will look like they are unrelated. The truth will be so shamelessly distorted about you. There will be this sidekick here and there. I think Nelson Mandela suffered more than a sidekick. And yet he said, if needs be, it is an ideal for which I'm prepared to die. Remember, as I round up, a revelation that I never knew anything about popped up recently when former President Kalima Mutlante was addressing a, a meeting at, uh, at Lily's farm. He said, a quality decision was taken by Mr. Nelson Mandela, Walter Sisulu, and all the Rivonia trialists that even if they were to be sentenced to death, they were not going to appeal the sentence. They decided to lay down their lives for you and I. Nelson Mandela didn't know me. I mean, where was I? I think I was a small boy. I had not even been to school, but uh, how could he know me? But they all were prepared to have their families destroyed, to have their children grow up virtually fatherless, to have their spouses harassed, tortured, and possibly even killed. They were prepared to die. It was not in, in anticipation of some well-paying political office or business opportunity that they were prepared to die. The, the, there was no room for any benefit. They were not trying to be populists. They were not trying to be heroes. They had a sense of purpose. There, is some, there was something worth dying for. What are you prepared to die for? I know many are prepared to kill for money <laughs> and even for positions and to lie artfully their way into wealth and positions of influence. But what Mandela-like ideal are you prepared to die for? Let us move away from saying what we are expected to say. When in fact, that which we profess to be our vision, to be our convictions, is far removed from what we really want and what we're really about. We have suffered enough for the past 25 years. A lot of good has been done. We've got to celebrate that. I wouldn't be where I am. Most of you would not be where you are. I doubt, Reverend Matibula, that you'd have been allowed to have a church here without breaking the law. So a lot of progress has been made. <laughs> a lot of progress has been made. There is a lot to celebrate, but there is also a lot to lament because there are far too many missed opportunities. But it's not too late. If only we were not to allow it to be business as usual. If only we were not to stay in a place where we always position ourselves for praise and favorable 
media coverage. I, I made a statement at one conference, and there were some serious media personalities there. I said, you know, in some of the media platforms, and I'm not attacking the media, I'm free to talk about anything. They, everybody talks about me too. I said, sometimes you get a sense that there are analysts who are not allowed to feature in some media platforms when certain issues are to be discussed. There is a cohort of carefully selected analysts, and you can tell in advance when this one appears. There's a particular narrative that is going to be championed. That's not how to build a country. You need objectivity. We can't have a situation where it looks like we sometimes come together and decide none, nobody should depart from this. As judges, we disagree all the time because the fundamentals of independence dictate that you do only what your conviction and what your conscience says is the right thing to do. You don't agree to see things in the same way. One, there's something about America because uh, when you turn to CNN, you know what to expect. When you turn to Fox News, you know what to expect. But our constitution says, Our media houses exist to inform, not to misinform the public. And there's a critical role that the media has to play to make sure that not some corruption, but all corruption is uprooted. The media has a critical role to play in ensuring not some unethical leaders are exposed, but all. No leader in the private sector, political system, in the judiciary, and in the media ought to be allowed to target innocent people and make them look bad for flimsy reasons. And we just sit back and say, it's none of our business. I think enough of this. We've got to be vocal. This is our country. It's an insult to the brains you have. It's an insult to the heart and the conscience you have to allow anybody to, mal to, to manipulate you in the furtherance of an agenda which, when you are sitting alone, be it in the restroom or wherever. <laughs> you know that this can only further sectional interests, but not the interests of all of us. I beg you all. Let us stop outsourcing our thinking responsibilities. Let us stop accepting as fact anything that is dished out to us. I keep on telling people that one of the intelligence agencies, in fact two, the German and the American one, many years back, did research. It's a project that was started by Hitler. And they discovered that all you have to do to discredit a person is to recycle a lie that is blended with the truth many times over. If you repeat it and repeat it and repeat it, ultimately, it's going to be accepted as truth. And there is something else that they discovered, that 87% of the public never interrogate anything that features in the public domain. They readily accept whatever is said. Ah, the problems that we have as a nation are far too serious.
For us to allow ourselves to be manipulated, it's a sign that you have no respect for yourself. It's a failure by any leader to allow themselves to be pulled by the nose like that. I say it without any fear of contradiction. I am ready to be insulted. After all, that's how I was baptized into my office. <laughs> I'm ready to be, to be misrepresented and deliberately misunderstood in pursuit of the ideals that Nelson Mandela was prepared to die for. If you want to say I'm a populist, if you want to say it looks like I'm salivating for political office, why don't I go out and be open about my ambitions, that's your problem. <laughs> my responsibility is to bear not just the responsibility for justice, but the chief responsibility for justice in my country. And I'm not going to allow myself to be intimidated into silence. I have seen through all the shenanigans that will keep us stagnant for another 25 years and 50 years. When I do wrong, criticize me factually. When any leader, regardless of how liked or disliked he or she might be, does wrong, criticize them factually. But let's make a determination for the sake of, of South Africa, for the sake of Africa that cannot make much progress without South Africa itself repositioning itself appropriately. Let's make a commitment that never again are we going to be victims of smears against others of manipulative messages, self-serving messages. Let us be prepared. All they can do, all that those with an insatiable appetite for power and money can ever do is to try to assassinate your character, not you physically. Mandela was prepared to be assassinated physically. So let us not betray this legacy. I thank you all. May you be the leaders, the functional leaders, that you have all the possibilities and the potential to become. I'm ready for questions. Thank you. No, no, no. Uh, 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 okay, okay, okay. Ladies and gentlemen, you may be seated. Uh, we will take um, questions. It's a Q&A session time. We will take from um, the business sector, from the faith-based organizations. I will ask that uh, when you ask a question, you just mention who, what your name is and which sector you come from. There are four roving mics, so we will take questions in sets of four, and then we will we'll answer them. Um, at the back there, there is a hand. Thank you very much for the opportunity. The name is Lorado Tsingeng. I'm the MD of Decode, a reputation management agency. Chief Justice, there's a common refrain that the terms of reference of the Zondo Commission is not far, is not going far and wide enough. From a legal point of view, what needs to be done to ensure that we really do exactly what you are raising, to say that we are not asking the hard questions, or rather, we are only focusing on one family. We know that there, may, there are others who are involved, but what do we do from a legal point of view? Thank you. I've noted a hand um, just next to the cameraman. 
We'll take four questions and then move. We'll come to that side just now. Africa. <laughs> Ukuzo kuluma no Chief Justice, and enfunugum kouta uti. Have we made it our business to reflect on the plight of the African people? We have done so as the community, and I would want to ask him to please open his doors so that when we come for advice, uh, the doors would be open. And this is about the justice that we need for the indigenous languages of our country. We cannot continue. We are seen but not heard. We are told that there are pansabs of this well. But as I understand, So, Sekela, Baba Mukwing, Raichu, Tau Tunayaka, Rekopabule Mamba Ti Ritle, Utori Eliza, Horobutata Jo, Reboliba Jamma Chung, Reborebutole. Can can we keep the questions short, please? I'll appreciate. Thank you. I'll take the third question there. Um if you can just pass the mic. I'm aware that there are also hands on the other side. We'll come there just now. Good day, uh uh, Justice, uh, Chief Justice. Um, um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, to, to speak to someone of your caliber, it's, it's frightening a bit. Uh, <laughs> you just have to understand. So my name is Mashuru. Um, I'm a CEO of Complex Intelligence Group. Um, my question is, as, as, as South Africans and as Africans, we have not held people accountable. The government, I don't think, is playing its role as accountability uh, to, to make things right. As the community, how do we deal with people of high caliber to hold them accountable? Thank you. There was a hand here. It's, it's... Uh, thank you for the opportunity, Chief Justice. You said where there's a will, there's a way. But what happens where there's no will? What do you do? My question is, what do you do when you are in a, you are put in a position where you cannot be able to deliberate because you are in this uh, organization where uh, you, you are only able to say things that you are told to say. I want, to, I want you to advise me, what do I do? Do I stand up and, 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 and tell the truth or do I quit and people label you that you are a failure? Thank you. We'll hand over to the Chief Justice on those four questions. No, thank you very much. Um, the Zondo Commission, the, the terms of reference are determined by the President. So nobody but the President can change them. So if we want them changed, we must say so to the President. It is his Section 84, 84, constitutional powers, I can't change them, you can't change them, but you can influence the change of those uh, terms of reference because after all, he is there to represent you and to do that which the populace says is the right thing to do. Oh, Baba Stone. Um, <clears throat> my door is always open. 
As a matter of fact, I've got a meeting scheduled tomorrow with the, uh, the board res responsible for ensuring that all languages are spoken, are taught tomorrow. <laughs> I've never understood why languages were removed from the educational system, particularly at the formative stages of a child in the educational system. I was taught everything, maths, biology, and whatever else in my mother tongue. And it made, me, it made it very easy for me to grasp the concepts. It was only when I went higher that uh, the language was changed. And that is why, unlike most of the children today in Model C schools, private schools, I can articulate myself from beginning to the end in my mother tongue. But take an average African child. They can't speak five sentences, if, if at all, without adding English. Somehow we've been uh, whipped into believing that you are not wise if you speak your mother tongue. So, <laughs> I say to people, that, you know, it's actually a shame, particularly people from my tribe, the Botswana people. You can't easily find the Botswana people. They may be two or five. Beginning and ending a constitution in their, a conversation in their mother tongue when they have a little bit of education. It's a disgrace. <laughs> and I, 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 I appreciate that there's a lot of mental damage that comes with... Uh, colonialism and neo-colonialism, but you can decide to liberate yourself from that. So I agree with you, it's going to require a lot of resources to be deliberately pumped into the educational system to develop all these languages all the way up to tertiary education. It's not going to be easy, but at least let's plan for it so that when the economy is in a state that allows us to move aggressively in that direction, we can. But nothing seems to stop us from going back to how we used to do things in the past. Bring back those books. In my language, bio, bio, in my language uh, biology is bonetetsi. So, <laughs> it's not as if the terms are not there. So let's insist, and I, I hear that there is a move in that direction. Let's keep on talking about that. It's not only the language. The value system. Respect. You know, when the African value system was inculcated in us, we respected everybody, our peers and the elders. We would never allow a child to burn a school and everybody is afraid to say this is wrong. But what's going on now? It's almost as if we celebrate the damage of roads with tires and whatever else, blockading roads, and we just get paralyzed. Let, I'm sorry, I know I'm taking a lot of time. Let me give you an example. In the estate where I live in Mafikeng, about two months or three months ago, I needed to go and address a meeting at the local university. And a few people, about 10 or 15, decided to blockade the road so that nobody can get out, come in or go out. The police were paralyzed. <laughs> hey, I realized something. One woman, and maybe it's proper to say a white woman, came and just confidently walked out of her vehicle, left the door open, removed those obstacles and threw them away. <laughs> and did what the police were afraid to do. <laughs> what is this? Let's inculcate the value systems that we know will redound in respect for self, respect for others, respect for the property of others being inculcated, and a value system that will make us all realize that there is something nonsensical about damage in the school that you need for the education of yourself and of your children.
If communities have to march against these things, let them do it. Where is the voice of reason? What is this that is imprisoning us from saying, but this is wrong? Why? The value systems. Let's inculcate them at home. Kindergarten, primary school, university, faith-based structures, at work, and every, everywhere else. Because when you have that, you will never close your eyes to the theft that is happening in your office. You will never buy a refrigerator that is new for 300 rand because you know the price. <laughs> you say, no, God doesn't give uh, by hand. He's <laughs> he's <laughs> he sent an angel to deliver. You are a thief. Accountability. People, leadership, ethical leadership and accountability are engineered. And the critical aspect of it is how do you choose leaders? I, I articulated this thing twice or three before and somebody tried to make a mockery out of it in a very nonsensical way. The starting point is, who is allowed to be a leader at any level of society? Whether it's a pastor, a teacher, a principal, how much do we make it our business to dig into the background of a person? To avoid having people who are going to molest our children in schools and even as principals, to avoid people assuming managerial and leadership positions in government circles and in, even in the private sector who are going to make it conditional to your appointment or elevation to sleeping with them or undertaking to give them money, however competent you may be. So here is my suggestion. I have said all the way up to the presidency, We've got to make sure that funding comes from the state. Elections don't come every month or every year. They come once in a while. Now, because we don't want state capture, we've got to budget whatever number of billions are necessary to distribute among those that deserve to run for political office. You may say, but how are you going to, to determine? That's what you and I must think about. We must not lazily accept what is already there. What is already there is a product of how far others could go in trying to find a solution. But because we know that system has not worked, nothing stops us from saying, but isn't there another way? Remember when the cell phone was introduced? I mean, the first Nokia cell phone was like a traditional weapon. <laughs> and scientists could easily have said, well, this is the cell phone. What are you looking for? But people kept on thinking beyond landlines, hello, hello, to cell phones. There is a way. So we've got to creatively say, this thing of people funding whoever they choose to anoint as future ministers, premiers, and presidents doesn't work for Africa. Just as we budget handsomely for other responsibilities, because of the critical nature of elections, we've got to budget very well for it if we are to preserve our future. Because otherwise, it's a question of those who are well-resourced. As empirical studies, particularly in America, have shown, identify, oh, this one is a smart one. Uh, let's groom him or her into a serious leadership position. Once they are there, they will remember that we made them. 
not the people. As I keep on saying, it no longer becomes a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. It becomes a government of the rich, by the rich, and for the rich. So, when the state representing the people have released the resources that facilitates eligibility for public office, then it becomes easier to hold people accountable. If you don't do that, you will come, you will continue to see very impressive election manifestos. Once people are in office, they keep on saying what is there, but not doing it. And you say, but these are smart people. Why can't they do the obvious? What is stopping them from doing what they undertook to do? Ah, money. Come election time. Uh, a recalibration of what was said many times before. A massive uh, media campaign and all sorts of uh, paraphernalia that goes with it. And people just get lulled into say, oh, maybe this time around. Maybe this time around. It will never happen. That has been the problem of Africa. That has been the problem of the developing world. And it has become the problem even of the developed world. So you'll never be able to hold them accountable. You'll find this person with a shocking track record. No ethical leadership at all. You are almost certain this person is going to go out. Oh, the person comes back even bolder than ever before. <laughs> ah. Mama Ariel Doaba. Mandela ran a very lucrative legal practice. He and Mr. Oliver Tambo, very lucrative. He had a choice and he knew that for him to enjoy the money that comes, being, comes with being an attorney and the prestige He had to obey the laws, however oppressive they were, however unjust he knew them to be. And for him to contribute meaningfully towards ending injustice, oppression, and exploitation, he had to say, well, if I starve, so be it. If I die, so be it. That is selfless leadership for you. That is ethical leadership for you. I keep on saying to people, just think about it. People were prepared to die, and many died. People suffered, and some continue to suffer, who were at the forefront of the liberation struggle. Black and white. They could have chosen money and positions even in the homeland systems. My schooling was funded by uh, the Buputazwana government. I was a very poor fellow. But I was very clear in my convictions. They would never give me a politically oriented uh, case. I would have refused. But I spoke out as a government employee against the discriminatory practices that were happening, even in our office. Because if you were black, you earned less than your white uh, colleague, however junior he or she might be. I said, this is wrong. I was interviewed by the media. I said, this is wrong. And I resigned. When I resigned, I was funding my wife's uh, education at the university. Uh, we had a child. I was responsible for the education of my two brothers. And I knew that my pension payout was going to be 8400 And I was paying a bond for my four-roomed house in the township. I had to pay for my accommodation doing pupillage here. If I failed, that would have been the end of me and maybe the end of my marriage. But principle dictated that I can't look like I'm commit colluding. 
So it's a choice. What ideal do you cherish? What, if any, are you prepared to die for, for the sake of the suffering masses? I, I, I think it will be a joy to die not because I was greedy, which is a problem in this country and around the world, but because I sought to champion the cause of justice regardless of what the loudest in our country choose to say about what I do or say. In view of time, I will take the last round of four questions, just Chief Justice, if you allow. And, and please, uh, we need to be succinct and to the point. I'm, I'm left with about 10 minutes uh, because we need to release people. Some have got... There's a roving market that's already been passed. Can you answer your, ask your question? I've seen Chief Justice. Um, my question is, how do we as a nation begin to properly integrate the rural and the poor community to the move that is happening within the broader spectrum of the country. Um, the reason I say, I move from a premise that says somehow, I'm gonna give an example, when we talk about fourth industrial revolution, when we talk about justice, it's things that are largely concerned with the urban metropolis and, and, and people who are close to the cities and all of that. And when we look at the rural communities, we don't have access to it. An example is, this kind of forum that we're having today, it's rare that you would find it in a, in a, a, a village in Lusegisigi or a village in Bushback Ridge. How do we begin to do that? Because it comes even into areas of justice, access to justice, access to state resources, access to offices, where people still travel long distances to access uh, certain basic services. How do we begin to create that justice as a nation? I think the point is made. Um, the roving mic. Please don't expropriate without compensation. Pass the mic on. Um, good morning, Chief Justice and in the audience. My name is Lydia Kindi. I just want to make a comment on the corruption. That wherever you are in, in any institution or be it a board of directors, it has become very difficult for people to stand for the truth unless if your bank account can sustain you. However, we also know that, as you were saying, that the truth actually makes us better, and God never leaves you, but it leaves those that don't have to be afraid and to continually want to hide because they've got children to feed. They've got extended families and households that they have to feed. Somehow we know that this has been institutionalized, but we need to help those that are sitting everywhere in those smaller and bigger forums to be able to speak and know that they are protected. There is a mic at the back there, you can speak. Good morning all. Um, my question relates to the heart and the mind where um, it's quite obvious that the um, battle for the liberation of the mass black population economically, it continues. And in fighting that struggle, one of the things that I've had a problem is, is this whole thing of how do I ensure that I hate oppression and not the oppressor? How do I ensure that, you know, it does not build hatred in my mind as I continue to fight the struggle? There's another question there. Yeah. Last one. My, my name is um, Advocate Steve. Sorry. There's a, there's a protest. Um, I, I've... <laughs> I've, I've, noted, I've noted the young, the young student here. I think it would be good to give her the last chance as to give her a question. You are on the floor, sir. Yes. My name is Advocate Steve Zwati. CJ, <clears throat> how does a black lawyer access constitutional court? And I say this because you would have noted that it is actually monopolized by other races. It's like black... Lawyers are not scholars, are not professionals when it comes to constitutional matters. And the last point, CJ, <clears throat> I have witnessed, and sorrowfully so, that when you go to these lower courts, when you look at the lower courts, you, you find our black people sitting like it's, they are in a hospital. 
when, when, when matters or courts are supposed to start at 8.30, they start at 10. And people are called to be there at 8.30 by magistrates. But matters do not start at 8.30. They start at 10. And when they start at 10, at 11, they go out for lunch. One hour. Instead of coming back at 11.15, they come back at, the, at 12 o'clock. One o'clock, they go out for lunch. So how then do you address those things? And lastly. Uh, that, no, 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 no. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay. Chief Justice, if I can just allow. Chief Justice, I, I, I feel that's a, that's a work, that's a work related question. <laughs> and you are protected if you want to relegate it. <laughs> You're on the floor, young lady. Um, my name is Tabiso Mullo from Rosefield. Um, Mr. Chief Justice, I would like to ask, being at a certain position, yes, we acknowledge there is higher people to account for, but what do we do if you're a leader, but you are still oppressed by the system? In our case, being in a school, the people who are higher than us, what is it that we can actually do to surpass that as learners? Sorry, before the chief, unfortunately, we won't take all the questions. He's a busy man. From there, he has to see the media briefing, and then he has to do another meeting. You know, maybe next time we'll ask him to give us another three hours of his time for the next meeting. So please understand, if you, are, you don't have that time, please understand. Over to you, sir. Thank you so much. Um, I really do wish we had uh, time so that it never looks like there's any question that one is avoiding. I'm one of those who believe that you need to ask me any question, however embarrassing you may think it is. The rural integration. I, I don't understand what's happening in, in South Africa and by extension in Africa because when I grew up, every family had a field and their fields and even their yards were productively used. People ate organic food, and that is why they lived longer and as healthily as they did. Something seems to have happened. And my reading says it was calculated. It didn't just happen. It was, there was a move to stop the rural people around the world from being involved in productive agriculture. Every, every family had uh, livestock, and the police were very well equipped and sharp to make sure that nobody thinks that it, you know, stealing other people's property can be fashionalized. So people were encouraged to farm. The result was you hardly ever came across a family that didn't have anything to eat. And because of the value system that obtained at the time, there was a an unwritten but real collective responsibility to look after one another. And strange enough, during apartheid, there was a program, a, a, a program that involved well-trained and effective extensions, agricultural extensions officer to guide the people about how to farm and offer refresher courses for free from time to time. As a result, people were very effective in doing what uh, they were doing. I suggest that we've got, to be very, we've got to very aggressively go back towards, even if it means forming cooperatives, but a lot of groundwork would have to be done. Our people don't know what it entails to run a business together as a unit. They don't. That is why even lawyers fail. You hardly come across a big black law firm. It, it, it seems to fail, but you need to be taught. You need to be great to uh, train. Land that has been brought back to the people in the rural areas, most of them have failed. It's not because these people do not have the potential to be effective farmers. It doesn't come automatically. You, we've got to, on an ongoing basis, have a system that prepares all potential farmers 
for the eventuality. When land comes or even with the land available, when you start farming, you've got to at least be equipped to do it. That is not happening. That has not happened. That is why people fail, however passionate they may be about it. In my discussion with one of the big uh, uh, agricultural associations, I said, you people interact with people in the rural areas a lot. You know those with potential. A person with a small piece of land who's able to make the most of it. A person with some few uh, goats or sheep or cattle who's able to, 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 to do well. You see them when they bring these animals to the, to the auctions. So target those people, help them, but also help create a database to government. And say to government, look, when land is restored or restituted, it doesn't have to be the whole community that gets the land. Because not everybody is interested in farming. Others want business. Make sure that you are as aggressive in the rural areas as you are in the, in the urban areas to capacitate people so that when opportunities come, they are able to make the most of them. Otherwise, you're setting them up for failure. And then you leave people to say, you see, this thing is failing. Land is being given to people who know nothing about the land. We all need to be trained to do well that which we, whether it is fat cakes you sell, whether it is peanuts you sell, even the management of the resources, the building of that capital, and not swallowing up everything that comes as quickly as possible, not rushing to buy a BMW when circumstances don't permit. That training you need. Bank account. Uh, you've got a family to support. Mandela did. He had a family to support. And so did Tambo, Sisulu, and so on. Same nation, same people. But I get your point because we have risen to the point where there is a certain level of comfort that we are enjoying. And uh, your children is at university or wherever. You just abandon everything. And everybody minds their business. Here is part of the value system that we must uh, embrace. During those days, I remember reading one of uh, the, this book of uh, George Bezos, 90 years or so, 65 years of, of friendship. One of the critical points that he makes there was when Madiba went to prison, he said, George, you've got to make it your business to look after my children. You know, that's the beauty of black and white people working together not seeing each other as enemies. He said, George, you've got to look after my family. And George was so dutiful that even when uh, uh, Ms. Zanani uh, Mandela Dlamini got married in Swaziland, although George Bezos is not into the Lobola business, he's the one who went there now to go and negotiate uh, Lobola. What am I saying? Don't wait until the harm happens. Moving from now, you've got to have that support system so that if anybody who stands for the truth gets victimized for standing for the truth, there is a support base because if there is no support, if there is no support and everybody who is committed to the cause of justice sees these people being completely run down, they will, they will check it out. Say, so this is what is going to happen to me. And those that do it to her or to him are sending a message, a very loud and clear message, if you try us, this is how we will deal with you. One of the problems is we would be knowing as leaders that this which has been said about uh, Reverend Matebula or or Pastor Andre is not right or is false, but it's none of our business. And people know that we are going to say it's none of our business. As long as it, does it doesn't affect me and my family, I'm going to stay out. It is about time that every form of injustice, every form of oppression and exploitation becomes our business. Every form of corruption becomes our business. And let's build that support base you can use something like this foundation, the People Matter Foundation, or create other foundations designed to sustain the families of those 
who may be made victims of, uh, of injustice and corruption. How do you champion this cause without being hateful? The man we are here to talk about is an example. I mean, I thought when Mandela comes out of Robben Island or Victor Verster, he would be spitting fire. <laughs> Considering how radical he was, you know, uh, in his younger days, I thought that man was going to be bitter against our white compatriots. He would be insulting and so on. But he connected with this reality. Hatred does more harm to the one who practices it than to the one who receives the effects of hatred. I mean, I won't elaborate, but think about this. If you hate me and I come here to speak, the desire of your heart is that I must blunder. <laughs> so if I sail through, you are itching and you go to the toilet from time to time. <laughs> As a result of the toxicity of the hatred that is in your heart, I've learned to forgive in advance. It works for me. Business opportunities for lawyers from, the, from uh, virtually the first week I became Chief Justice. I've been campaigning to the state attorney. I've been appealing to the state-owned enterprises because they don't support black lawyers as much as they should to support them. I learned in my engagement with some of the, uh, the people that some cabinet ministers, I, I, I'm not vouching for it as the truth, but I was told by some people in government that no, some cabinet ministers said, no, don't go to the black people. We want competent people here. That is the, the extent of the mental damage that has happened. And that explains why Ishmael Mohammed, Pius Langa, the Kamu Seneke, Sandy Lengob, the previous chief justices, none of them ever received any meaningful brief from white uh, South Africans. Why? Is it racism? I think we've got to make it our business to make each other understand how the nation stands to benefit if only we can get to the point where we support each other. Let's continue to speak out, but constructively. Don't condemn those who are not doing it. Help them to appreciate it. In the number of meetings that I've addressed, Weber, Wenzel, these big uh, attorneys firms, I say to them, please, we have a collective responsibility to support our white compatriots, and our black compatriots. Let it not look like you still harbor that mentality that uh, only some are competent, only some have the potential, but others can never have that potential. And even people in the private sector, it's our individual and collective responsibility to make them understand. People, one of the reasons why I think students out of desperation would damage buildings that they need is because, is because there are no avenues available to allow them to, to ventilate what is in their chest. That platform must be created. Why is it that uh, students or pupils in the so-called white schools don't burn schools? Some mechanism must have been found to deal with the challenges that apply to them. I think all schools must perform a study, must find out what is it that can normalize relationships in all schools. What meaningful platform for engagement do we need to avoid students burning schools and then they have no school to go to? I don't think if we create a platform for students to express themselves, you'll ever come across a situation where they do what in reality they don't want to do. Thank you so much.